All right, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone back to UCSF's Cardiology Grand Rounds. We are recording and live streaming onto YouTube. I'm honored to be able to present today, Dr. Matt Durstenfeld. Dr. Durstenfeld, of course, is a graduate of our own training program. In the short time since his fellowship, he has been backed by NIH funding to study the cardiovascular impact of COVID-19. And he's in a short time become our local expert in COVID and the heart. Dr. Dersenfeld is a non-invasive general cardiologist who sees patients at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. His research focuses on the impact of infectious diseases on the cardiovascular system, namely HIV and SARS-CoV-2. He is a co-investigator of UCSF's long-term impact of infection with novel coronavirus, or LINK study, and the NIH's Recover Initiative, which is a cross-disciplinary study across the US that's looking at the long-term impact of COVID-19. Dr. Dersenfeld graduated from medical school at the University of Pennsylvania, and he went on to complete his residency at New York University. He stayed on for an additional year as a chief resident before coming here to UCSF for cardiology fellowship. Upon graduation from fellowship, he was awarded a K-12 grant from the NIH, and he began his career as an assistant professor at UCSF. He also recently completed his master's in advanced studies and clinical research through the Ticker program. Welcome, Dr. Durstenfeld. I'm excited to hear your talk. And if anybody has any questions over the course of the talk, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of the talk. Or if you prefer to just keep your questions anonymous, go ahead and direct message me and I'll ask them uh, on your behalf at the end. Dr. Dersenfeld. Thank you, Layla, for the introduction and to the Division of Cardiology for the opportunity to give grand rounds today. Before I get started, I want to recognize a few of the individuals without whom I would not be presenting here today. First, I want to thank Priscilla Shu, Steve Deeks, Don Grandis, and Carlin Long for their support and mentorship. I would also like to thank Michael Peluso, my counterpart and role model in infectious diseases, and our entire research team. I could not have done this work without the many people who have contributed their time and effort, and I've tried to acknowledge a few of the co-investigators for individual aspects of their work with their photographs. As this is a rapidly evolving field, some of what I will share today has not been peer reviewed and, on, and I will present some of our ongoing work as we contribute to the global efforts to understand long COVID. So here's a brief outline for what we'll cover today. We'll start off with what is long COVID and how prevalent is it? Then we'll move on to whether cardiac involvement is plausible in long COVID. We'll look at some of the evidence for and against cardiac involvement causing long COVID symptoms and then consider some non-cardiac mechanisms. And hopefully I'll leave you with some clinical implications in future directions. The story begins for me personally, and for most of us back in the spring of 2020, two and a half years ago. Back then, we were most concerned with trying to save patients' lives who are dying of ARDS from COVID pneumonia and hoping we ourselves would not be infected. It was not that long ago, there were no treatments and no vaccines. Although most people who survive acute COVID-19 recover, in spring of 2020, patient advocacy groups began sounding the alarm on social media that debilitating symptoms could persist. Then the mainstream media began to pick up these stories, like this one in the New York Times in May of 2020. The CDC defines long COVID as symptoms lasting more than one month, and the World Health Organization with symptoms lasting more than three months after a history of probable or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. And the World Health Organization also specifies that symptoms should last at least two months and should not be explained by an alternative diagnosis. Symptoms generally have an impact on quality of life and everyday functioning. And they may be new onset following initial recovery or persist from initial illness. And symptoms may fluctuate or relapse over time. I think it's helpful to step back and clarify some of the jargon because there's a lot of it within this uh, emerging field. The most commonly uh, used terms um, and initially started by the NIH's um, working group is uh, post-acute sequelae of COVID-19 or post-COVID syndrome or PACS, post-acute COVID syndrome. And a person recovering from COVID-19 may experience this, which includes long COVID or long haulers, which is a definition anchored on unexplained symptoms 
as well as the post-ICU syndrome, post-hospitalization syndromes, and other sequelae like diabetes, pulmonary fibrosis, social isolation, chronic thromboembolic disease from a pulmonary embolism suffered during acute COVID-19, for example. We're going to focus today on, the, on long COVID, again, the definition anchored on symptoms. And before we go any further, I do want to mention that vaccination does decrease but does not eliminate the risk of developing long COVID. And we have clear cases of vaccine breakthrough long COVID in our local studies, but it does seem to be anecdotally less common in the pre-vaccine era. So what is the prevalence of long COVID? This is the first question most talks begin with. What is the burden of disease? If we're meeting in person, I might have people raise their hand to vote what they think the prevalence is, or since most people watching today have probably been infected with SARS-CoV-2 by this point, I might ask how many of you have long COVID. Instead, I will share my conceptual model and how I sift through all the data out there. I hope this is a helpful framework for you and may bridge some of the differences between those who think long COVID is rare and those who think it is very common. So um, this is a pyramid that I came up with. So at the bottom, we have all post-acute sequelae of COVID-19. This includes things that manifest with or without symptoms that might be consequences or things that we notice after COVID-19. Less common, but um, still very common, are symptoms that persist after um, acute SARS-CoV-2 infection. Not all of those symptoms will be attributable to long COVID. Some of those symptoms may be due to other conditions um, or to other consequences of long COVID that are post-acute sequelae, but are not necessarily unexplainable. When we get to long COVID attributable symptoms, at this point, we're still considering those which are unexplainable by other medical conditions. And there are individuals who have an inability to complete even their basic activities of daily living. And for those individuals, um, long COVID can be extremely debilitating and profound. So some people, when they're referring to long COVID, really are only talking about this very top of the pyramid. But um, our definition is certainly more expansive, considering those with long COVID attributable symptoms. To understand each of these levels of the pyramid, specific study designs may be helpful starting with case control studies at the top for these more debilitating severe long COVID, comparing those and with and without this, um, this level of disability. Uh, next, we have long COVID clinical research cohorts like our link study that you'll hear more about today. And then um, to understand what the prevalence of symptoms is, population-based epidemiologic surveys with intentional sampling are really uh, necessary. And to understand uh, the extent of post-acute sequelae really requires knowing what was going on before and after COVID. So one of resource for that is uh, cohorts of deep phenotyping before and after COVID, such as the UK Biobank. So what is, how common is PASS? Um, so this systematic review and meta-analysis, again, the highest level of evidence from our pyramid of evidence, um, found that the prevalence was 55% of post-acute sequelae, 55%. Now, that probably seems high to you. I, I think uh, most people kind of read this number and are, are struck that they, they don't seem like, it doesn't seem even possible that half of, more than half of people who've been infected with COVID-19 have some lasting effects. One of the issues with uh, trying to do a systematic review and meta-analysis of lumping together a, a lot of these studies is a lot of these suffer from particular issues with selection bias and other issues that tend to exaggerate the prevalence. EHR studies like this one from Vanderbilt from the VA, in which Dr. Ali and colleagues found that survivors of COVID-19 were 1.2 times more likely to present for outpatient care. Um, are even more at risk for um, exaggerating uh, the, the um, extent or burden of, of post-acute sequelae of COVID-19. So why is PASC overestimated? It starts with um, this idea that we have all SARS-CoV-2 infected individuals, some of whom may or may not have symptoms, and many of the studies, particularly early on, were post-hospitalization cohorts. Again, these are patients who are much more likely to have symptoms and had much more severe acute illness. So these people are much more likely um, to be included in these kinds of cohorts and um, to have post-acute sequelae, whether or not they're attributable to long COVID or other post-COVID conditions. 
The second thing is measurement bias. And this is particularly true in EHR-based studies where you may miss symptoms that are reported but not uh, coded with a diagnostic code, or you may, um, may misattribute uh, diagnostic codes to things that patients don't really have. There may also be misattribution um, and time-varying trends, uh, which may affect the, um, our ability to estimate the effects of vaccines and variants, as well as changes in seeking medical care and public awareness and concern about long COVID. Lastly, there are issues with uh, who you compare these uh, participants to, and all, as always with observational research, lots of risk for confounding. So what we need really is population-based studies. These two studies in the UK um, found wildly different prevalence of long COVID. Uh, this one found 37% if you count one or more persistent symptom greater than 12 weeks. And this one found a prevalence of 3 to 12%, depending on the methodology used. Of note, 12% was the self-reported uh, people with long COVID, and 7.5% of people had limitations on their activities because of their long COVID symptoms. In studies in the US, this one done by the CDC found that 31% of people have at least one long COVID symptom. And this other study, which accounted for pre um, pre-infection symptoms found that 23% of individuals had symptoms consistent with long COVID, even after you subtract out the symptoms that they had prior to infection. This is um, a paper from our cohort um, led by Michael Peluso. And uh, I think it helps us understand what the common symptoms are, which include fatigue, brain fog, um, insomnia, anosmia or dysphusia, issues with smell and taste, headache, dyspnea, joint pains, and nausea. And some of these wax and wane over time. But um, one thing that I want to point out is the cardiopulmonary symptoms here, which at 12 to 36 weeks are seen in 10 to 20% of participants. So when you encounter patients with long COVID, which you will, um, I think one uh, helpful uh, idea is to place the per person on the framework. If you're seeing someone who has diabetes after COVID and they didn't have it before, they might fall in the post-acute sequelae towards the bottom of the pyramid. They're still having symptoms, symptoms like I just discussed of fatigue, brain fog, shortness of breath. You want to make sure that there aren't other conditions that are causing those symptoms. You want to rule out those other causes before you attribute those symptoms to long COVID. But even so, you will see patients with symptoms that are not explained by other medical conditions, some of whom have a, an inability to complete their activities of daily living. Patients with these conditions, particularly with cardiopulmonary symptoms, will get referred to cardiology out of concern for their hearts. Before we move on, I just want to pause for a moment to mention that um, one of the things that comes up is uh, that long COVID may be similar to other post-viral syndromes or more broadly, post-infectious syndromes. The most fascinating overlap to me, particularly with symptoms, is with the post-Ebola syndrome, which I learned about in the last uh, year or so um, from one of our colleagues. And unfortunately, many of these post-viral syndromes are poorly understood and have limited actionable treatments. Hopefully, our understanding of long COVID will help lead to better understanding of other post-infectious syndromes. So when we refer to a patient who may have long COVID and has cardiopulmonary symptoms, that could cause the first question that may be on your mind is, could SARS-CoV-2 infection cause lasting effects on the heart? And here, I'm not talking about the people who had COVID-associated myocardial infarction, pulmonary hypertension from chronic thromboembolic disease after a PE that they had during acute COVID, or patients who developed incident atrial fibrillation and were hospitalized. There are three reasons why I think it's plausible that SARS-CoV-2 could have direct effects on the heart. The first is that there is evidence of abnormal um, echocardiograms in acute COVID-19. Positive troponins are also highly prevalent, um, as well as elevated BNPs. Building on work I started when I was a fellow, um, Kevin Sun, a graduate of the Internal Medicine Residency Program at UCSF and Heart Failure Hospital at Parnassus, demonstrated that RV dilation and RV dysfunction on echocardiogram are associated with in hospital mortality in acute COVID-19, as well as in other acute respiratory illnesses. Secondly, uh, SARS-CoV-2 can infect in vitro cardiac myocytes, 
uh, as shown here by this paper from the investigators at the Gladstone. There's also autopsy evidence, which I'll come back to in a little bit, that SARS-CoV-2 virus is detectable in the hearts of many people who die from acute SARS-CoV-2. Third, cardiac inflammation may persist beyond the acute phase. I'm sure many of the people watching this are included in the greater than 1 million views that this pathbreaking paper by Puntman et al, um, which suggested that 60 to 70% of individuals have cardiac inflammation after they've recovered from SARS-CoV-2 infection. It was published with this editorial by uh, Clyde Yancey and Greg Bonnero that came out simultaneously, asking if heart failure is the next epidemic after um, SARS-CoV-2. So the next question is, could SARS-CoV-2 infection cause long-lasting cardiopulmonary symptoms? To answer this question, we partnered with the Long-Term Impact of Infection with Novel Coronavirus Cohort, led by Michael Peluso and Steve Dietz, which they founded in April 2020. This year, we've also joined forces with the NIH's Recover Initiative. LINK recruits individuals with acute SARS-CoV-2 infections through some of our partner studies, as well as individuals in the post-acute period. So to understand the frequent reports of cardiopulmonary symptoms, including dyspnea, chest pain, and palpitations, we developed the LINK cardiovascular substudy. We included a subset of the LINK cohort willing to participate in additional cardiopulmonary tests after excluding those with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. In addition to their baseline LINK symptom questionnaires and biomarkers, we performed echocardiograms at a median of six months after acute infection. Then we developed a protocol that included cardiac MRI, non-invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing, and ambulatory rhythm monitoring, performed at a median 18 months after infection. We've studied 120 participants, including 56 with cardiopulmonary symptoms and 64 without cardiopulmonary symptoms. The two notable demographic features um, or, uh, that are associated with having long COVID symptoms are female sex and being hospitalized for acute COVID. There were no other significant differences in medical history or other demographics. In our paper published in JCI Insight, we demonstrated that inflammation as assessed with high sensitivity CRP, SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain antibodies, and possibly pericardial effusions are associated with cardiopulmonary symptoms in long COVID. Importantly, we've also demonstrated a number of negative findings, especially that echocardiograms are largely normal, except for again, pericardial effusions. This finding has been consistent across our study and a, a large number of other studies by this point. So as I mentioned, then we did cardiac MRIs and we still found evidence of pericardial effusions, but we found no evidence of, of myocarditis at 18 months. And furthermore, cardiac MRIs demonstrated normal cardiac function. Uh, one interesting finding was that having a higher level of high sensitivity CRP early on um, was associated with having pericardial effusions even a year later. But importantly, MRI parameters were not associated with symptoms. And again, we found no difference in late gadolinium enhancement, T1 or T2 parametric mapping, or extracellular volume. So how could we not have a single case of myocarditis? Did we just get really lucky? To make sense of these findings, I'll take you on a quick tour through the literature, starting with the gold standard for diagnosis of myocarditis autopsy. So in this systematic review, which included 50 studies of 548 hearts, uh, the authors, here's table one, found no evidence of myocarditis in most studies. How, even though cardiac necrosis was very common, SARS-CoV-2 virus was highly detectable in the hearts, and cardiac edema was, was also common. Again, myocarditis is very rare, even in acute SARS-CoV-2 infection. What is the incidence? Well, according to the CDC, the estimated incidence is 150 per 100,000, or 0.15%. This is 16 times the baseline risk of myocarditis in the population. And in other studies among healthy athletes, the prevalence of cardiac MRI findings suggestive of myocarditis after COVID-19 range between 0.7 and 2.3%, and most of these are mild or asymptomatic cases. So even though initial reports suggested very high rates of myocarditis, when we look more deeply, even at those who are hospitalized for acute COVID-19, who do, tend, um, are, do have a myocarditis pattern more commonly on MRI, 
um, we don't find that this uh, holds true. Because of everything in the popular press, um, I do want to take a moment to emphasize that mRNA vaccines are associated with increased risk of myocarditis after the second dose, especially among young men. Sorry. Sorry. Fortunately, most cases are mild, and the overall risk benefit is highly in favor of vaccination. Even just looking at COVID myocarditis in itself, the rate of COVID myocarditis is much higher than the rates of vaccine-associated myocarditis. And Although these numbers have probably changed uh, now uh, with more people being infected and more people having immunity from vaccination, um, so maybe these numbers are different. Uh, the number of cases expected from uh, vaccination with mRNA vaccines, again, most of which are mild, is much less than the burden of disease from COVID-19, even among young men. So getting back to our myocarditis and acute COVID-19, Patterns of myocardial injury among hospitalized troponin positive patients do include some individuals with a myocarditis pattern, as well as others with a myocardial infarction pattern. Um, but importantly, even in these patients who are hospitalized with severe COVID-19 with positive troponins have normal cardiac function in nearly 90%. And these, sub -lo these localized subendocardial late gadolinium enhancement or inflammation was found to be no different from hospitalized patients with uh, positive troponins. So how do we reconcile these differences? The Puntman study that said cardiac inflammation is very common and ours, which said we didn't find any at all. Well, one possibility is that cardiac inflammation resolves quickly. Here with studies using PET-MR, uh, demonstrated a really significant resolution over a period of several months um, from people who had inflammation evident on cardiac PET um, that resolved over time. And by six months after mild COVID-19, in this study by Joy et al., there is no difference between cases and controls on any of their five uh, primary and five secondary endpoints using cardiac MRI. Another important concept is that um, what about post-acute sequelae? So people with or without symptoms, what if there's some, uh, some subtle changes on in the heart that we might not see um, in these small studies. Well, in this study from the UK Biobank, which had cardiac MRIs performed before and after people had COVID in about 640 people with COVID and 645 match controls, there was no difference in any of these cardiac MRI parameters over time. Now, the two main limitations of this study are that they did not have used contrast, and so there's no late gadolinium enhancement or parametric mapping and they included individuals irrespective of whether or not they have long COVID symptoms. Coming back to our cohort, we had a lot of negative findings, which I think is overall good news for patients, uh, that uh, we found normal cardiac biomarkers, normal electrocardiograms, normal resting cardiac function on echo, including strain and pulmonary artery pressures. We found normal resting lung function on spirometry, and we've had no evidence of scar on cardiac MRI. And importantly, there's no differences between those with and without cardiopulmonary symptoms. So what about symptoms where resting echo and cardiac MRI may be normal? Well, thinking about palpitations, uh, this in this study by Tommy Doolin and Greg Marcus done early in the pandemic, um, found that there was no significant evidence of clinically significant arrhythmias about three months after COVID-19. Led by our Summer Explore student, Chris Hill, who's a UCSF medical student, um, we extended these findings by uh, doing rhythm monitors in our cohort and found that there were, again, no significant, no clinically significant arrhythmias um, 18 months after SARS-CoV-2 infection. Interestingly, those with long COVID did uh, press the button for symptoms three times more often than those without, but still we didn't find any evidence of arrhythmias. We'll now move on to the symptom of exercise intolerance. To investigate the causes of exercise limitations, we used cardiopulmonary exercise testing with support from Erica Sander, Amanda Aris, and Carlin Long. Participants ride an upright stationary bicycle that increases in difficulty while wearing a mask to measure oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production while we monitor symptoms, electrocardiogram, and blood pressure. It allows for objective, reproducible determination of exercise capacity or measured peak VO2 with age, sex, height, and weight-specific norms. Importantly, it also allows for classification of exercise limitations based on the pattern of abnormalities observed in those with reduced exercise capacity. 
So on cardiopulmonary exercise testing among participants with and without long COVID 18 months after SARS-CoV-2 infection, we found that exercise capacity as measured by peak VO2 in milliliters per kilogram per minute on the left and in percent predicted on the right was reduced among those with cardiopulmonary symptoms compared to those without symptoms by 5.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute adjusted difference or almost 20% lower than predicted. Possible causes of reduced exercise capacity include ventilatory limitations, cardiac limitations, and deconditioning. To our surprise, we found no individuals with a ventilatory limitation and only a few with a cardiovascular or hypertensive limitation. The most common abnormal finding was a smaller increase in heart rate than we expected during exercise or chronotropic incompetence. I will note here that because we did not do invasive CPET, there are certain causes we cannot exclude related to ox oxygen extraction. Um, however, we did not find any non-invasive correlates of those findings. And here, we only considered people as having chronotropic incompetence if we didn't find any evidence of anything else that could be limiting their exercise capacity. So having an abnormally low heart rate during exercise, shown here using the adjusted heart rate reserve, uh, is associated with reduced exercise capacity as shown here. As you can see in this plot, there's a cluster of individuals with long COVID symptoms with low adjusted heart rate reserve and low peak VO2. Chronotropic incompetence or adjusted heart rate reserve less than 80% is highly associated with cardiopulmonary symptoms with an odds ratio of almost 20 and with reduced exercise capacity with an odds ratio of 10. So what could cause chronotropic incompetence in long COVID? The differential for chronotropic incompetence includes heart block, which we did not observe, sinus node dysfunction, and autonomic dysfunction. Ambulatory rhythm monitoring may provide some clues about which of these causes it may be. Again, on ambulatory rhythm monitoring, we saw no evidence whatsoever of heart block or prolonged PR intervals, um, or evidence of sinus arrhythmia or other sinus node dysfunction. On the left here, we have the plot of exercise capacity uh, measured in terms of percent peak VO2 achieved. And the yellow here is those with chronotropic incompetence. The teal here are those with reduced heart rate reserve or decreased uh, heart rate during exercise, but had the normal exercise capacity. And then the purple are the normal people with normal exercise capacity and normal heart rate response during exercise. When you look at the correlation with heart rate variability, those with a normal exercise uh, heart rate response had a normal heart rate variability. And then as you look to those with chronotropic incompetence, the heart rate variability was reduced, which is a clue that, um, that there may be something going on with the autonomic nervous system. On ambulatory rhythm monitoring, we also found higher resting heart rates, higher minimum heart rates, and lower maximum heart sinus heart rate among those with chronotropic incompetence. Similar to our published findings in a larger cohort, um, we found that peak VO2 18 months after infection was highly correlated with previously measured biomarkers and antibodies. These measured here at three to five months and these measured at six months, um, but with no association between troponin or BNP and exercise capacity. So how could this happen? What are some possible mechanisms? Well, SARS-CoV-2 infection could lead to chronic immune activation and inflammation, perhaps because of uh, viral reservoirs with um, uh, persistent viral proteins um, or due to dysregulation of the immune system, um, or it could directly affect the autonomic nervous system. Together, these may lead to a dysregulated response to autonomic signals resulting in chronotropic incompetence, decreased heart rate variability, and decreased heart rate recovery, as well as reduced exercise capacity and possibly symptoms. So how do our findings and link fit with other CPET studies in long COVID? We conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis of, of cardiopulmonary exercise testing in long COVID and identified 38 studies, including nine that compared those with and without long COVID. In random effects meta-analysis of those nine studies with about 400 patients in each group, we found that exercise capacity was lower among individuals with long COVID compared to those infected with SARS-CoV-2 without persistent symptoms. Although given the issues with each of the particular studies, we do have low, low confidence in the estimate. 
Some issues with generalizing the findings from these studies to all of long COVID are that they're mostly included individuals three to six months after hospitalization for severe acute infection and define symptoms each in their own way. In trying to identify themes for exercise limitations from these studies, the most common pattern reported was deconditioning, which may also reflect peripheral oxygen extraction or utilization issues, which is not surprising since most of these studies included mostly hospitalized individuals with a severe acute infection. Besides deconditioning, all of these other findings could be related to autonomic dysfunction. Now, when we think of autonomic dysfunction and cardiology, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS, usually comes to mind. In this study, which used heads-up tilt table testing to assess autonomic responses in long COVID, um, the, um, they found in these 24 individuals that abnormal heads-up tilt table testing was very common. We're working on replicating these uh, findings now in our cohort um, with uh, work from Narosh and Maharashi, our UCSF summer explore medical student, and we're hoping for results soon. I also just wanted to mention this study before we depart from the heart and bring up this very recent um, study that uh, individuals referred for cardiac pet for chest pain or dyspnea. They found that those with COVID-19 had a much higher prevalence of reduced myocardial flow reserve compared to those referred for the same testing without COVID-19. And this was associated with a higher risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. This is consistent with several other smaller studies that have found evidence of endothelial or coronary microvascular dysfunction after, after COVID-19. So I've briefly mentioned a few ways that cardiac function, particularly with exertion, could be associated with long COVID. But most of the plausible explanations for long COVID lie outside the heart. One of our primary goals in the LINK study is to discover mechanisms that contribute to long COVID in order to identify potential treatments. There is emerging evidence supporting many of these possible contributors, including persistent COVID virus with a viral reservoir similar to that in treated and suppressed HIV, to ongoing chronic inflammation and immune activation, uh, to evidence of reactivation of other viruses, um, potentially including EBV, changes in the gut microbiome, which also could increase chronic inflammation, um, as well as issues with clotting, and immune responses and autoimmunity, although we haven't found evidence of autoimmunity in our cohort. And then among the other unknown mechanisms, autonomic dysfunction may be one. As we've systematically tried to work our way through these potential mechanisms in the LINK cohort, our work has resulted in a number of publications targeting some of these mechanisms with more in the pipeline. As I said, one of the most interesting concepts or potential mechanisms is the idea of viral reservoirs, that there may be uh, some way that SARS-CoV-2 continues to hide and replicate or be um, present, or there may be viral particles that are activating the immune system. And this study, which just came out, um, found evidence of spike protein even one year after, only among those with long COVID, but not among those blue here um, who have had recovered COVID-19. This may um, provide data to support using spike protein as a biomarker in order to measure COVID, uh, measure long COVID, um, which is one of the things that our field is currently lacking. I'll also briefly mention this idea of microclots or activated platelets. Um, again, clotting is definitely an issue in acute COVID-19, and uh, one of the concepts of how uh, uh, COVID-19 could lead to uh, long COVID symptoms is the idea of persistent activation of the um, of platelets uh, resulting in, in this concept of diffuse microclots. And there's a group in South Africa with collaborators in Liverpool who think this is the main cause of long COVID. And many patients are uh, trying to get treatments uh, based on these data. Um, however, uh, the data in acute COVID-19 suggests that antiplatelet therapy is not effective. And uh, the data for anticoagulation um, is mixed, um, where mostly the uh, additional benefits of preventing catastrophic thrombosis are outbalanced by the risks of bleeding. So I think this kind of uh, this uh, study really needs replication before applying it to clinical practice. There is an urgent need for clinical trials in long COVID. Again, I think clinical trials have two benefits. The first is that we can identify 
effective treatments that work for patients to help them feel better. And also uh, testing specific mechanisms may provide more insights into whether those mechanisms are actually perturbed in long COVID and causing symptoms. So we're hopeful that efforts um, through the Long COVID Research Initiative and through Recover may start to identify some potential treatments. As we've learned from the acute COVID trials, interventions which seemed obvious, and especially those which had no scientific basis in targeting a relevant mechanism, did not always pan out. There's right now a lot of uh, tr small trials of things that have a very low likelihood of success registered on clinicaltrials.gov, but what we really need are uh, trials with a strong foundation in a potential mechanism uh, to actually identify treatments for people. I'll mention two strategies or, that we have that we're using to try to identify potential treatments. The one that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on is uh, using translational be bench research to identify potential treatments, um, which is not our, our group's strength, at least mine. Um, so two other potential strategies to identify treatments is using observational data. So um, I'm really excited about um, partnering with the COVID-19 citizen science team, um, including Greg Marcus and Mark Pletcher, to try to understand if acute treatment with antiretroviral therapy results in reductions in persistent COVID virus, something that we can't yet measure, ultimately resulting in a reduction in long COVID. The second strategy our group employs is small mechanistic-based proof of concept studies. As background for the study I'm about to share, I'm going to mention some study, these two studies um, of cardiac rehabilitation or pulmonary rehabilitation exercise-based programs, which have resulted in significant improvements in peak VO2, functional status, symptoms, and quality of life with six to eight weeks of exercise-based rehabilitation. It seems harmless enough. We have two studies that demonstrate a benefit. Why don't we just prescribe exercise to everyone? Well, similar to myalgic encephalitis and chronic fatigue syndrome, Exercise-induced symptom worsening or relapse, which is termed post-exertional malaise, has been reported in long COVID, particularly among those at the top of the pyramid, those with really severely debilitating long COVID, and those with brain fog, it is possible that physical activity may worsen long COVID symptoms, although the true prevalence of this condition and the mechanisms are not well understood. In contrast, exercise is an effective treatment for POTS which is also a post-viral autoimmune condition um, where there's uh, evidence of deconditioning. Um, secondly, exercise is the only effective treatment for chronotropic incompetence in heart failure other than devices. Um, shown here, an exercise-based intervention significantly improved peak exercise heart rate among those with heart failure, improved um, heart rate reserve, and the heart rate reserve improvement um, was highly correlated with improvements in peak VO2. So with this background in mind, I'm excited to share our new trial, Care Bear Long COVID, or Cardiac Rehabilitation for Building Exertional Heart Rate for Chronotropic Incompetence in Long COVID. It's now IRB approved, it's registered on clinicaltrials.gov, um, and we're working closely with Don Grandis and the UCSF Cardiac Rehabilitation and Wellness Center to do this trial. We're including adults with SARS-CoV-2 at least three months prior, ongoing symptoms, and evidence of chronotropic incompetence. We're excluding those with significant cardiovascular disease and severe post-exertional malaise due to the concern that risks may exceed benefits among those participants. The intervention is 12 weeks of cardiac rehab, and participants can choose a fully in-person or a hybrid approach. And the primary outcome is improvement in adjusted heart rate reserve and exercise capacity with exploratory outcomes and symptoms. Infl inflammatory markers and endothelial function. Please email me at matthew.durstenfeld at ucsf.edu if you have patients who may be interested. So now getting back to clinical applications. I think the first and most obvious starting point is to ask patients about their symptoms. Um, if you don't ask about symptoms, you may not know about them. And self-reported e reduced exercise capacity is highly associated with objectively reduced exercise capacity in our study. Patients can usually identify if they experience significant post-exertional symptom worsening. I would be cautious about prescribing exercise for these patients, as it is possible that that, that could worsen their symptoms. I would recommend considering basic cardiac testing to rule out other diagnoses. And I do think, based on the um, all, all of the evidence we have from cardiac MRIs, that among those with normal echocardiograms, 
cardiac MRIs are very likely to be normal. And so I'm not sure that that has much clinical utility in regular practice. I would recommend considering cardiopulmonary exercise testing for those with reduced exercise capacity, because although um, most of the people in our study who had reduced exercise capacity had chronotropic incompetence, again, something we don't have effective treatments for, there were some individuals with other conditions that um, are important to rule out, including coronary ischemia. Among those with chest pain or um, without obstructive coronary disease, who have risk factors, things like obesity, hypertension, diabetes, it may be worth considering assessing coronary microvascular function. And lastly, I think it is really important to refer patients to clinical trials as they become available. One way to do that is, um, is by uh, joining one of the observational cohorts, such as what we run through LINK and Recover. So I think some key takeaways that I hope you got from this talk um, are that you understand that the definition of long COVID is based on symptoms. And I hope that this pyramid is helpful for you, both in terms of framing patients in your own mind, but also in helping bridge some of the um, political differences between uh, people who have strong opinions about the prevalence of long COVID. I think you should expect that there, most patients with long COVID will have normal cardiac testing, even in those with symptoms. Um, so I think it's helpful to frame patients when you're speaking with patients to frame the testing as we don't expect to find anything, but we want to make sure nothing else is going on if you think the test is going to be helpful or appropriate. For most people with long COVID, it's not because they have myocarditis or ever had myocarditis. Um, and uh, I think that's helpful um, because it frees us from kind of following our, our typical myocarditis um, protocols of how we manage patients, particularly after acute um, fulminant myocarditis. And there's no treatments yet. Um, hopefully, there will be some coming soon. Um, there's, again, a lot of um, excitement about potential clinical trials, and we're, again, launching this one um, that I hope you'll have patients who are interested in. With that, I'd like to thank our incredible team, especially Priscilla Shu, Steve Deeks, Michael Peluso, Don Grandis, and Carlin Long, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Dr. Gersenfeld. That was a great talk. Uh, so do we have any questions from the audience? If, if you have a question, please feel free to leave it in the chat or just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Um, Matt, I had a question. So uh, do we have any information on people who have had multiple COVID infections and how that might impact long COVID. You know, people are getting COVID for second and third rounds. And I'm wondering if they're more or less likely to have long COVID if they've had multiple infections. That's a great question. I personally think the jury is still a little bit out on, um, on that. Um, I think initially it was kind of unclear whether having COVID more often would be, um, would resolve your long COVID, would it make it worse? I think um, there, again, is one study from the Vanderbilt group um, at the VA that suggests that having, long, having COVID more times um, results in receiving more medical care. I'm not 100% sure if that really translates to people having more long COVID or just being more worried about long COVID, um, but I certainly don't think there's any data to suggest having COVID more times is better for you. Got it, that's helpful. Um, Michael, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? I'm happy to read it out loud if not. So the question is, Matt, um, do you think there is one unified mechanism for all types of long COVID, or do you think that there will turn out to be different mechanisms for cardiac versus neuro versus other etiologies? Another another excellent question. So, um, you know, there's always this philosophical divide between the lumpers and the splitters. And um, I think there, there clearly are different phenotypes and there's overlap between them. So there's a neuropsychiatric phenotype of people whose predominant symptoms are brain fog and fatigue. There's the cardiopulmonary type um, of people who have shortness of breath, reduced exercise tolerance. And actually there's a lot of overlap between those two. Um, so I, I kind of wonder if there's um, kind of an underlying predisposition um, or something that puts people at higher risk of getting long COVID because clearly not everybody does, and that um, there may be kind of a single um, underlying mechanism for the big picture idea of long COVID, whether it's 
viral um, reservoirs or reactivation of EBV, something like that that's non-cardiac, but then there are people who have kind of extra susceptibility to these cardiac specific mechanisms. For example, maybe they have uh, abnormal endothelial function, which is something that's highly associated with chronotropic incompetence. And maybe the people who had kind of risk factors like obesity, hypertension, diabetes, are the people who then go on to um, experience that particular manifestation of long COVID when they have some sort of viral reservoir activating their immune system. Great, and Dr. Preet, did you wanna go ahead and ask your question as well? Um, hey, uh, great talk, Matt. I just, um, my question was, uh, if any of the microvascular angina treatments have been tried for long COVID. Um, no, I think this has been uh, hypothesized as a potential mechanism of long COVID for quite some time now. Um, and this study that just came out last month is really, I think, the strongest evidence we have that it really is contributing. And to my knowledge, there have been no clinical trials uh, looking at whether treatment of microvascular angina results in improvement of symptoms in long COVID. Again, that's an area where we don't have great evidence-based treatments, um, but an area with uh, lots of opportunities for more research. Thanks. Then, Dr. Nishtala, you had a question as well. Are you able to unmute yourself and ask? Okay, no mic, no problem. Um, so Dr. Nishtala's question is uh, whether all patients who undergo CPET or underwent CPET in your study had objective evidence of maximal or near maximal effort. And did you exclude patients who did not demonstrate this? Yeah, that's a great, um, very technical question. Um, so uh, in the, the 43 patients included in the data I presented, all of them had uh, an RER, respiratory exchange ratio, um, well over 1.05. Most of them had one uh, an RER around 1.2 to 1.3. So we feel very confident that these are maximal exercise tests. Um, and we, um, we did exclude one participant um, who was taking a beta blocker um, and had a significantly um, lower RER than we, um, we would have expected. Great, any other questions that we have from the audience? Another question I had was um, um, just thinking about predictors of long COVID, is there information uh, about the primary infection, things like the duration of symptoms, severity of symptoms, or how they were treated and does how that impacts whether people get long COVID or what their symptoms at that point look like? Yeah, um, excellent question. So, uh, you know, if we uh, knew that treating patients with Paxlovid, for example, could prevent long COVID, then we would strongly recommend that everybody take it. Um, right now, there's a real lack of data um, looking at what acute treatments actually prevent long COVID. Some of the consistent things that, um, that seem to hold true across multiple studies um, are that uh, female sex or female or gender may be associated with increased risk of developing long COVID, similar with other post-viral syndromes. Um, as, and in our study, um, obesity also has some association with, um, um, with developing long COVID. Um, and uh, there are other studies which have suggested maybe diabetes might be associated and then it does seem that increased severity of illness, um, so people who have more acute, uh, severe or acute illness are probably at higher risk of long COVID, although it's a little bit hard to tease out because they're also at risk for those other post-acute sequelae um, that may not be kind of strictly explainable by long COVID. Uh, so I think that kind of gets back to the vaccine question, which is, we know that vaccines do seem to reduce the risk of developing long COVID. So potentially um, decreasing exposure to, um, to the amount of virus or um, decreased severity of illness by that mechanism may re result in, in a lower risk of developing long COVID. Again, I mentioned our citizen science project that we're uh, just starting out, but one of the things we're gonna look at is whether acute treatment with um, particular treatments for um, acute COVID-19 is associated with lower risk of developing long COVID. Um, again, an area where there's a lot of research needed and, and unfortunately the randomized controlled trials of acute uh, treatments uh, did not include follow-up to look for long COVID. <laughs> 
Great, thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? If not, I think it's okay for us to conclude. And thank you again, Dr. Dersenfeld, for such a fantastic talk. We should have a recording of this that's available on the division's YouTube page shortly. And I hope to see you all again next week. We're going to hear from Dr. Khadija Brethit from Indiana University about inequities in heart failure care. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks for having me. And again, feel free to reach out if you have any questions that I didn't answer today. All right. Take care, everyone.